So it's increasingly evident in various solid tumor types that growth permissive microenvironmental changes accompany solid tumor progression in a way that reflects the disruption of normal tissue homeostasis during wounding. In a wounding response, epithelial cells respond to secreted factors produced by professional wound healing cells like fibroblasts. This includes soluble factors like cytokines and growth factors and insoluble factors like extracellular matrix components. Epithelial cells respond to these signals and in turn change their microenvironment and this reciprocal crosstalk promotes tissue regeneration and healing. This process involves transient gene regulatory and metabolic changes that enable epithelial cell proliferation, regeneration, and repair. Classical features of a wound healing response are often seen in the microenvironments of solid tumors, including similar cellular players. And we also now know that several key oncogenic mutations drive similar metabolic reprogramming to enable anabolic processes that support tumor growth. And so these similarities raise the possibility that microenvironmental and oncogene-driven networks may share common gene regulatory effectors that drive metabolic and inflammatory transcriptional outputs. So I've focused on these networks in pancreatic cancer, a malignancy that we know has a particularly prominent stromal compartment. And it's been shown that cells of the tumor-associated stroma, and stromal fibroblasts in particular, can play roles that are both tumor-supportive and tumor suppressive or homeostatic in enacting a wound healing response as they've evolved to do. And so I thought an improved understanding of the molecular basis of cell-cell interactions in the tumor microenvironment may help us to identify and target these tumor supportive mechanisms with the hope of leaving the tumor suppressive or homeostatic mechanisms in place. So to begin to study this, I wanted to understand how the diverse secreted factors derived from stromal fibroblast influence the epithelial compartment with respect to gene expression. So to begin to study this, I developed what I'm calling a stromal culture system. So for this, I embed pancreatic cancer cells in a 3D polyethylene glycol-based hydrogel together with collagens, major components of the extracellular matrix in pancreatic cancer. And to incorporate soluble stromal cues into this system, I use conditioned media from patient-derived stromal fibroblasts as the growth medium in this system. And then as an astromal control, I grow pancreatic cancer cells in the same 3D peg-based hydrogel, but with no collagens. And I just use DMEM, the, the vehicle for conditioned media, as a medium for growth. So though these stromal cultures contain diverse signals from the tumor microenvironment, these are homotypic cultures easily amenable to functional genomics and metabolomics. So to start to probe the effects of stromal inputs on pancreatic cancer cells, I put three different KRAS mutant pancreatic cancer cell lines into astromal and stromal conditions and analyzed gene expression by RNA-seq. So the RNA-seq data showed that stromal Q significantly regulated gene expression in all three cell lines tested. And to gain some insight into the functional consequences of these changes, I analyzed the changed genes by geontology analysis and saw that the regulated genes were implicated in the cell cycle, uh, inflammatory or immune responses, as well as a number of processes implicated in anabolic metabolism, including biosynthesis of cholesterol and lipids. Uh, this was accompanied by uh, upregulation of genes involved in catabolic processes like glycolysis that can generate metabolic intermediates for use in these anabolic pathways. And so when I first saw these gene categories, as well as the specific gene identities on this list, the list looked familiar to me and was reminiscent of a paper that came out four years ago now from Lou Cantley and Rhonda Pinot's labs, in which the authors wanted to better understand the proximal functions of oncogenic KRAS in pancreatic cancer cells. And so for this, the authors used a doxycycline-inducible allele of oncogenic KRAS to drive pancreatic tumor progression in mice. So in mice harboring this allele, dox administration leads to uh, activation of oncogenic KRAS in the pancreas. These mice develop pancreatic tumors. But with DOCS withdrawal, KRAS turns off, and these tumors shrink down over time. But to gain some, func some insight into the proximal function of oncogenic KRAS in these cells, the authors established tumors, withdrew DOCS acutely, and did transcriptomic and metabolomic analysis. And what they found is that oncogenic KRAS reprograms metabolism in these cells, increasing glucose uptake and lactate production, and also increasing flux through a number of anabolic pathways. 
So in light of the observed similarities between the genes found in this study and mine, I wanted to better compare these gene sets. So I did gene set enrichment analysis comparing my RNA-seq data to the microarray data from this paper. And I saw that genes that are down-regulated upon oncogenic KRAS extinction are significantly enriched among stroma-inducible genes. Or put another way, genes that are positively regulated by oncogenic KRAS are enriched among those that are induced by stromal cues. And remember, this is the co in the context of oncogenic KRAS in these cell lines. Uh, so to see whether these similarities in gene expression translated to metabolic phenotype, I wanted to look and see whether stromal cues impact the ability of these cells to take up glucose or secrete lactate. And indeed, I found that uh, human pancreatic cancer cell lines both consume more glucose and secrete more lactate in the context of stromal signals. So I just wanted to look at the steps in between. So for this, I collaborated with Alec Kimmelman, a lead author on this paper, to do intracellular metabolomics on human pancreatic cancer cells. And the metabolomics data showed that in the context of stromal cues, pancreatic cancer cells undergo a significant increase in intracellular levels of metabolites involved in glycolysis, the pentose phosphate pathway, and downstream components of nucleic acid synthesis, as well as uh, metabolites in the TCA cycle. And just looking at a few specific regulated metabolites, we see that stromal cues increase levels of metabolites that are not only in a number of RAS-regulated metabolic pathways, but also a number of specific uh, RAS-regulated metabolites shown here in yellow. And so I thought that these metabolic changes, as well as the transcriptional changes, may impart a growth advantage to pancreatic cancer cells when they're in the presence of stromal signals. And so I grew pancreatic cancer cell lines in these stromal cues and, and under stromal or astromal conditions and measured viability. And I find that pancreatic cancer cells grow happily and really to a very similar extent whether stromal signals are there or not, so long as they're in nutrient replete conditions. Uh, but as we heard from Beautiful Talks this morning, pancreatic tumors are not nutrient replete. And in a paper that Cosmo mentioned earlier, there was beautiful metabolomic analysis of human pancreatic cancers showing that these tumors are nutrient poor and in particular are depleted for key carbon sources, glucose and glutamine. And so I repeated these experiments under lower glucose and glutamine concentrations. And I find that under these conditions of nutrient challenge relevant to human pancreatic cancer, stromal signals impart a significant growth advantage to pancreatic cancer cells. And so together, others have shown that oncogenic KRAS activates a transcriptional network, leading to induction of an anabolic gene signature, increasing glucose uptake and expression of pro-inflammatory genes, increasing intracellular levels of glycolytic intermediates, and increasing the presumed capacity for steroid biosynthesis. And I find that in the context of oncogenic KRAS, stromal signals drive similar cellular responses, suggesting that these networks may share some common gene regulatory effectors, which would make for appealing therapeutic targets. But in order to get at these targets, I wanted to better understand the mechanism by which stromal signals were regulating gene expression in these cells. So at about the time I was getting these results, a paper came out in which the authors took tissue arrays of human pancreatic cancer and divided them into what they called low fibrosis or stroma poor and high fibrosis or stroma rich regions. And they then stained these regions for two different acetylated histone marks, acetylated H3K9, a marker of active promoters, and acetylated H3K27, a marker of active enhancers. And what they found is that both of these acetylated histone marks associated with gene activation are significantly enriched in stroma-rich regions of human pancreatic cancer. And so I, when I saw this, I thought maybe stromal cues regulate the pancreatic cancer epigenome and histone acetylation in particular to explain in part the gene expression changes I saw downstream of stromal signals. So to start to look at this, I took soluble secreted factors in the form of conditioned media from patient-derived stromal fibroblasts put them onto pancreatic cancer cells, and measured levels of histone acetylation globally um, by doing Western blots on acid-extracted histones. And here I see over a time course of exposure to soluble cues from the stroma, both of these acetylated histone marks that are enriched in stroma-rich regions of pancreatic cancer increase over time in pancreatic cancer cells. Uh, I'll also mention that in the paper I discussed on the last slide, the authors showed that growing pancreatic cancer cells in 3D collagen, but not on top of collagen in 2D, also increases levels of these two histone modifications. 
And so I thought that my stromal culture system was a nice way to put these signals together, both 3D collagen and soluble cues from the stroma, and look at histone acetylation globally in response to these relevant stromal signals. So for this, I made a minor modification to my stromal culture system. I build the cultures essentially the same way, but using a thiol-modified uh, peg-based crosslinker. This is still biologically inert, but here the uh, matrices can be broken apart using a reducing agent. I use N-acetylcysteine, enabling recovery of a single cell suspension that can then be used for CHIP or ChIP-seq as usual. Um, so I'll show you uh, genome browser tracks from ChIP-seq experiments for H3K9 acetylation. I find that under astromal and stromal conditions, there are a number of genes that are so-called stroma independent. These are highly expressed and to a similar extent whether stromal signals are around or not. And we see high levels of H3K9 acetylation in the promoter regions of these highly expressed stroma independent genes. But looking at stroma inducible genes, I see a significant increase in promoter acetylation at these genes that are in diverse biological pathways that are consistent with the gene expression changes I saw in my RNA-seq experiments. I also validated the ChIP-seq data by site-specific CHIP using both H3K9 acetylation and H3K27 acetylation. And I see significantly increased acetylation levels at promoter or enhancer regions upstream of inducible genes like LIF, UPP1, and CXCL1. So I next wanted to determine which transcription factor is recruited to affect these uh, induced expression of, of stroma-inducible genes. And I was drawn to MYC early on, given that the paper I discussed earlier implicated MYC really as the key transcription factor downstream of oncogenic KRAS that drives transcription of this anabolic gene program. And I also saw that MYC binding sites were enriched in promoter regions of the stroma-inducible genes that came out of my RNA-seq data set. So it's known that in KRAS mutant cancer cells, MYC is typically phosphorylated on serine 62, as Rosie discussed earlier, um, and is thus stabilized. MYC is typically otherwise a highly unstable protein. Um, so we expect MYC to be phosphorylated and expressed in these KRAS mutant cells. And so I thought maybe stromal signals are doing something else to MYC to otherwise regulate it in the context of its phosphorylation and, and expression in these cells. So I first looked at MYC expression in pancreatic cancer cells. And over a time course of exposure to conditioned media from stromal fibroblasts, I certainly see no increase in uh, MYC protein levels looking in whole cell extracts. If anything, there looks to be a decrease at 24 hours. Um, MYC is typically, I also see a constitutive phosphorylation of serine 62, which seems to also be independent of stromal signals. Uh, MYC is typically localized to the nucleus. So in parallel, I took nuclear extracts. And here I mean the soluble nuclear extract, soluble in 400 millimolar salt. And here I see a, an increase in MYC over a time course of exposure to soluble cues from the stroma, um, specifically in this soluble nuclear fraction. I also looked in cytoplasmic extracts, and MYC is totally undetectable, uh, as expected, for a nuclear protein. So to try to figure out where MYC was hiding, I subfractionated nuclei from these cells that were uh, exposed to DMEM or conditioned media. And I see that there's a substantial pool of MYC that's in the insoluble nuclear fraction in these cells. But when they're exposed to signals from the, so these stromal fibroblasts, I see a pool of MYC that seems to move into the soluble fraction of the nucleus. To try to get some insight into the significance of this move, I did chip for MYC under astromal and stromal conditions. And I find that under stromal conditions, I see an accumulation of MYC on the promoters of stroma-inducible genes. So I think there's still a lot of work to be done to understand the significance of this soluble MYC in terms of its global localization, but does seem to correlate with increased MYC promoter occupancy on these genes that are consistent with MYC function in, in various cancer cell types. I'll also mention that MYC knockdown reduced histone acetylation uh, at these promoter regions. So how can we target this therapeutically? MYC itself is not directly druggable at present, but the associated epigenetic gene regulatory mechanisms are. So typically, acetylated lysines on histone tails are read or sensed by bromodomains within chromatin interacting proteins. This interaction leads to recruitment of macromolecular complexes that activate transcription of associated target genes. And so when I was doing these studies, there were small molecule inhibitors available for one family of bromodomain-containing proteins, the BET family, 
um, in the form of JQ1 and related molecules. Um, JQ1 acts as an acetylacine mimetic and blocks recognition of acetylated lysine by BET family proteins, thus suppressing activation of associated target genes. So I thought that if histone acetylation and subsequent transcriptional activation was underlying the stroma-inducible changes in gene expression, JQ1 may block those changes induced by signals from the microenvironment. So I asked, can bromodomain inhibition in these cells block these stroma-inducible changes in gene expression? And so for this, I used the BET bromodomain inhibitor JQ1, going back to my three KRAS mutant pancreatic cancer cell lines under stromal conditions and measured gene expression by RNA-seq. And I found that JQ1 induced negative regulation of stroma-inducible genes. And these gene sets showed a statistically significant inverse correlation between genes that are upregulated by stromal signals and downregulated by JQ1. And this included genes in a number of anabolic pathways that overlap with the RAS signature I discussed earlier. So we next wanted to take JQ1 in vivo. And I'll mention that the anti-tumor efficacy of JQ1 has now been published by other groups in pancreatic cancer, including beautiful recent papers from Julianne Sage and Matthias Hebrock. Um, but we have tested JQ1 in vivo and find that it significantly suppresses pancreatic tumor growth in orthotopic transplant models. Um, it also reduces proliferation of cancer cells in these models. But here we're treating with a drug that can target not only cancer cells, but also a number of cells in the tumor microenvironment. And a number of inflammatory cells have been shown to be responsive to JQ1 with respect to their inflammatory potential. So to gain some insight into the molecular and cellular specificity of JQ1, I wanted to determine which that bromodomain family member was really responsible for this effect in cancer cells. So the BET family has four members, BRD234 and T. BRDT is testis-specific, but BRDs 2 through 4 are all expressed in pancreatic cancer cells. And so I knocked these family members down individually in pancreatic cancer cells and looked to see which knocked down most closely phenocopy JQ1 with respect to negative regulation of stroma-inducible genes. And I was surprised to find that while others have shown very nicely that BRD4 plays an important role in pancreatic cancer cells in driving cell autonomous gene regulatory networks, actually BRD2 seemed to be the important BET family member in driving stroma-inducible gene expression. So I also found that BRD2 was recruited to promoter or enhancer regions of stroma-inducible genes when I did CHIP in the presence or absence of stromal cues, suggesting that there's some mechanism from the microenvironment that's causing BRD2 to load onto these promoter and enhancer regions, presumably via increased histone acetylation. So I next wanted to look at the effect of inducible BRD2 knockdown on pancreatic cancer growth in vivo, specifically knocking down BRD2 in the epithelial compartment. And so to do this, I generated an inducible BRD2 knockdown cell line, transplanted that into the pancreas, allowed tumors to establish for 10 days, and then kept the mice on or off docs. And in these experiments, I find that doxycycline has no effect on tumor growth in control uh, hairpin cell lines. But in this BRD2 knockdown cell line, I see that doxycycline significantly reduced pancreatic tumor growth. I'll mention that this line definitely grows less aggressively than the control, and at this point I don't know whether that's due to leaky expression of the hairpin uh, in vivo um, or because this is just a less aggressive clone. And so I'll conclude with a model such that in pancreat RAS mutant pancreatic cancer cells, MYC is phosphorylated and seri on serine 62 and stabilized downstream of RAS MAP kinase signaling, but it seems to be in part localized to an insoluble fraction of the, of the nucleus, which we now believe uh, is the nuclear matrix. But it seems that MYC is also subject to spatial regulation within the nucleus by signals from the fibroinflammatory stroma. These stromal signals lead to an accumulation of MYC in the nucleoplasm and to increased association with promoter regions of stroma-inducible genes that support proliferation. These stromal signals also lead to increased histone acetylation and BET protein recruitment and ultimately to induction of a growth-permissive gene expression program. And I also showed that genetic or pharmacologic inhibition of the BET bromodomain family and BRD2 in particular suppressed these transcriptional changes and also suppressed pancreatic tumor growth in vivo. And so with that, I'll thank my mentor, Ron Evans, and members of the Evans Lab involved in the work. Also thank our wonderful external collaborators and funding sources. And before I close, as Jeff mentioned, in one week, I'm moving to Portland to start my lab at OHSU in this building. 
and I'm looking for postdocs. So if anyone is interested in joining me to continue studying the pancreatic tumor in microenvironment, please find me at the break, or you can email me at my recently assigned new email address, shermama at ohsu.edu. <laughs> um, and with that, I'll thank you for your attention.